Hi, everyone, and welcome from all of us here at Houston Grand Opera to our pre-show event. My name is Jeremy Johnson, dramaturg at Houston Grand Opera. Tonight, we have the distinct pleasure of re-releasing the current three episodes of our video opera series, Starcrossed. Starcrossed is a web series of short operatic films, all of which are themed on Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Now, some of you watching tonight might think that releasing opera in a digital format like this was due to the pandemic. Yes, HGO Digital pivoted from live performances to the digital space for that reason. But tonight's videos were actually an exploration of the digital possibilities for opera long before the pandemic began. Episode one of Starcrossed was released in April of 2018. Episode two was released in June of 2019 and episode three in October of 2019. So if you hear anyone claiming that they've been leading the innovation of opera film through the pandemic, gently remind them that Houston Grand Opera has been innovating for a few years longer. All thanks to our community and education department, HGO Co., led by Carlene Graham, director of HGO Co., and Emily Wells, senior producing manager of HGO Co., who have spearheaded this fantastic web series. If you've been to one of HGO's live digital pre-shows this season, you're familiar with my spiel about how the pre-show stream is not the same stream as the release of the event itself. Well, tonight, it is the same stream. So for everyone watching now, you can just stay on this video all night. Our pre-show tonight is a conversation with the episode creators, composers, and librettists of the music and words that you'll hear tonight. Following that on this stream, we'll watch episode one titled Boundless. And during intermission, Carlene and Emily will interview two of the film directors, following which we'll stream episode two titled Now, and then episode three titled A Rose. So stay with us here on this stream tonight and you won't miss a thing. If you have any questions for our creators throughout tonight's pre-show event, please feel free to, to put them in the chat, uh, the comment section on Facebook or on YouTube, uh, and we'll be able to see them and respond on here live. So we're talking about digital opera videos in these three episodes. In the context of the pandemic, the old adage, necessity is the mother of invention comes to mind, but these videos were created before necessity drove the opera industry into the digital space this season. So how did our star-crossed web series get started? It started as most things do in the collaborative arts, simply a conversation between creative minds. HGO's artistic and music director, Patrick Summers, was talking to composer Avner Dorman about how audiences could access opera on a device of their choice, not just in theater spaces or concert halls. The idea developed from there about a YouTube web series. Avner is the composer of the first two episodes of Starcross, and I'm thrilled to welcome him on with me uh, tonight. Welcome, Avner. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy. Really glad to be here. Uh, so to start us off, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you became a composer. Um, so I grew up in Israel, um, and uh, you know, I, I played piano, but I was always interested in, in composing. Um, my father uh, played in the Israel Philharmonic and was also a conductor. And so I kind of grew up in, in a very musical home. Um, but I always, I always was most interested in improvising and recording myself. And so I ended up uh, during my army service being an arranger and then going to uh, Tel Aviv University. And, uh, and after that, I went to Juilliard to get my doctorate in composition. That's how I ended up in uh, this country. Um, okay. So That's great. What, what did your father play in the Israel Philharmonic? He played bassoon. Bassoon? Uh, okay. Yeah, so not in each of, either of the operas of tonight, but uh, okay. maybe yeah. a future one. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. Right, so when you say you, uh, you grew up kind of improvising and recording, what instruments did you grow up playing uh, that you improvised on? You know, my, my first instrument was the cello, but it was kind of short-lived. And then um, I wanted to play drums, but my parents were not um, really ready for that in an, in an apartment. Um, yeah. I grew up in a suburb of Tel Aviv, so we lived in an apartment. And um, my dad said, you know, if you learn piano for a couple of years, then when you know how to read music and all that, then we'll get you a drum set. And uh, that just never... <laughs> I got into the piano. I was I, I was really enjoyed it, and 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 the instrument clicked for me. So, so piano is my uh, my official instrument, um, the one that I actually know how to play. <laughs> yeah, sure, that's uh, great. So, so you're in the states now. Where are you talking to us from now? Where are you based? 
I live in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, okay. uh, which is a historic American town. Um, I, uh, I teach here at Gettysburg College at the Sunderman Conservatory of Music, and I've been here for about uh, 10, almost 11 years now. Uh, so that's where I'm based. Yep. Very great. So tell us about those initial conversations like about uh, creating an opera video with Patrick. What, how did that all get started? No, I thought about it today because I was, I was you know, preparing mentally with a little time that I had to think about it. And I think all these ideas of like doing a, a, a web opera, an opera that you deliver through the web and doing an opera that's like m sort of telling the story of Romeo and Juliet, but in modern circumstances and finding those stories around the world, like from, from actual people, like all these ideas were in my mind as separate things. And then when I was talking to Patrick, I was like trying to think about it because he was like, this was your idea. And I'm like, I never had the idea of this series as an idea, but somehow as we were talking, all these ideas came up. And of course, his knowledge of Shakespeare is, is incredible. Um, and of course, of opera. And like, as we were talking, I feel like he kind of, you know, we kind of kind of created this like snowball effect. And like, I think it was one or two conversations where we were like, okay, this this seems, um, and then and then he brought in uh, other people, Emily and Carlene from um, HGO. And, and it just, it just seemed to kind of, kind of, kind of appear. I, I don't remember like a moment where, where it was not, and then it was, but it kind of, yeah. kind of all these, all these thoughts about, um, about, you know, how, how do we make our art more accessible and more um, relevant, uh, easier to act, you know, it's, all of us mm -hmm. know how it is to like to get to the theater and to find the time and when do you do it so it, it all kind of clicked together and uh, like you said in retrospect it's uh it kind of seems you know like we were a little bit ahead of the of the curve <laughs> there because now now obviously happy run has to do it but yeah um there's just kind of a lot of different creative strings just being pulled at and and, and woven together in, in different conversations huh yeah, and 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 I think I think the the sort of now you can't go to the theater at all. But even before the pandemic, you know, going to the theater is a, is a luxury for a lot of people. Um, going to the opera is a luxury for a lot of people, whether it's um, money or time or you know just finding the way to make it work. You know, finding mm -hmm. a babysitter. Uh, so all of these things are are there are many barriers. I think to getting people involved in uh, the art form, and I think we all felt that it was it was uh, uh, sort of a, a worthy um, effort to try to find a way to to basically get to our audience in another in another way. Um, yeah, absolutely, yeah, that's great. Well, let's bring on your first collaborator. Uh, we've got Stephanie Fleischman with us, the librettist on uh, episode one. Now, Avner, actually, you're you're kind of unique in our creators tonight because you were the composer on two of the three episodes uh, that we'll be streaming tonight. Uh, and the librettist for the first episode one is Stephanie Fleischman. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi, thank you. So, Stephanie, uh, same first question. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself, your background, and how you became a writer and librettist. Um, I was always a writer ever since I was a tiny kid, but um, I was mostly a playwright, and I worked a lot with music. Um, and but I grew up around classical music. My dad, I sort of, Avner, I have a connection there. My dad ran the LA Philharmonic, so I grew up in an orchestral world um and actually that um mostly orchestral so so i didn't actually start writing opera until after he passed away um and um one of the ways that i got into opera i music was always in everything that i wrote but uh, opera was still you know a new world for me um was through american lyric theater so um and um i applied to American Lyric Theater um, just after my dad died. And it was a really interesting way of kind of grieving um, was through listening to opera and talking about opera and learning something about the canon. I still feel like there's so much more to learn, but um, that was really where I started. And I've really found my stride in, in this form. 
since then. Fantastic. What yeah. was the piece you worked on uh, with ALT, with American Lyric Theater? Can well, you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I mean, it's a, first of all, you have a year of training. There are four composers and four librettists. It might be a different com combination now. Um, but ultimately, they commissioned Jeremy Howard Beck and I to write um, The Long Walk. And we are now working together um, at, at HGO Co. Um, with uh, Homeless, the opera that has a title, but maybe isn't quite um, yet a title um, about homelessness in Houston. Yeah, yeah. We yeah, have the Long Walk, a, a fabulous piece, and I know all of us here at HU are really excited for your next piece together. So yeah. we're looking forward to that. But let's let's talk about uh, Boundless, Episode One of Starcrossed. Uh, so it's based on a true story. Uh, how did this story come to your attention? Avner, do you want to talk about it? I, I can if you, if you okay. yeah so we we were um Emily and I um we talked quite quite extensively about how do we get stories from people um we wanted it to to be you know real stories by real people we had a call for stories and um I actually reached out to a person that I know who is a, a fairly famous film producer um and he said you know uh, you should contact the Moth Radio Hour. They they have really uh, wonderful wonderful stories there. He's like, I listen to this show all the time, and I I had heard it before, but not I was not like an avid listener. And I believe Emily was the one who reached out to them, and um, we listened to some stories. And um, this was one of the stories that really caught everyone's uh, attention and like our our imagination. And so that's that's how that's how we found this story actually. Oh, that's fantastic, hey, Stephanie. Could you tell us a little bit about the story? Yeah, so it's um, about an older woman who was in um, France, I believe, um, and um, uh, she lives in Houston. Um, but uh, she was she, her life had taken her um, abroad, and she met a much younger man and they fell in love. And she had this incredible romance with him, um, which involved, I, th I think he he's a painter and I think he, he had a beautiful house and she, she just was exposed to sort of um, the intimate moments in, like, when you're in a living in a foreign country, you don't you often have access to these places and these these moments. And it was a beautiful romance. And then he wanted to have a child. Oh, should I? Maybe I shouldn't talk about. No, that's all. all right. Um, and so she she decided that this was not okay. She already had two children by her first relationship, and um, so she she tried to break up with him, but they were so close um, that she failed on numerous counts to break up with him. Um, and finally she met someone, I mean, really it's a spoiler alert. So, so is that okay? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, you know, okay. I, well, I think it's okay. I think a, a lot of our audiences love to come to the pre-show events to, to learn a lot about okay. what they're about to see and experience. Okay, yeah. great. So she, by chance she met, she, spotted a woman in a cafe and realized that that was the perfect person for her love. And she went over and started talking to her and they became immediately fast friends. And she then devised a way for her, this beloved to meet this woman. And it was indeed a kind of sort of spark. And then she just disappeared. Um, and they fell in love and had a child. And at the end, um, well, she she goes to see, several years later, she goes to see a, sh a, a painting show of his. Um, and there is a tiny child there who has heard all about this kind of fairy who introduced her parents. Wow, that's an yeah. amazing story. Yeah, it's a beautiful story. So, so the in the real life story, they uh, it the the older woman uh, you've named her Alma. Yeah. Is is that the the real name of the real? Okay, okay. So Alma uh, is was not friends with the real life Sophie uh, when 
it, it, it appeared in the film that they maybe knew each other for, for quite some time. When we get to that scene in the film, at the, at the wedding that they know yeah. each other already? Um, I don't, I don't know about sort of what the acting choices were, but, but uh -huh. the original story is uh -huh. that, that, um, no, I mean, they, they knew each other when she introduced him. She, Got it. she, Got it. yeah. So but, I'm I mean, they just met, they were yeah. like new friends okay. and she was Got like, it. come to this party. Got it. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for that background. Uh, Avner, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the opening musical section. So there's a really uh, energetic vibraphone in the opening. And there's kind of this like uh, whispered number in the background that if our audience is, listens closely, there's a number that they're whispering. Could you tell us about that? So the, the whispers are, are the, the numbers 45 and 29. And those are the ages. Her, she was forty-five. He was twenty-nine. And so, when I, I actually, when I first saw the first draft of the of the libretto, that it was just there for me. Like I saw those numbers, and I was like, "That's like I just I just heard it. It was like so like that's that's what I want them to hear." And we didn't even plan to have like like voices. Um, we had to like add voices to the to the cast. Um, but it it just grabbed my attention so much as like, you know, like it represents everything in a way of the story. And also uh, there's something really musical about these two numbers in conjunction with each other, like 45 and 29 are, are you know, they're almost, they almost, they almost like, like they rhythmically rhyme or something like that. Um, and so I just heard it. It was, it was really quite immediate for me because I, for me, like the, the interesting thing about these stories is, is you know here there's many many things but the relationship to Romeo and Juliet is like what is the what is the limiting factor you know in Romeo and Juliet there, there's parents who are like no you're not going to do that that's not a very common thing that we associate with our life nowadays but there's so many other limiting factors there's so many other limiting life circumstances and so I thought you know that that was kind of the the thing that grabbed me first, um, and that's and that's why it starts like that. Like like it's in her mind. Um, I think in the description of the libretto, if I remember correctly, she's she's on a bus, right? And she's she's originally, I think in the original draft. Uh, yeah, yeah, she's like on a bus, and she. So to me, she's like hearing those voices saying 45 29 for like this is the thing that is like you know like when you're in when you have like a strong dilemma. Like, what are the things that she's thinking? Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great musical opening. And actually, when we, when we get to the second episode, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, how, you, how you open both of them. Um, Stephanie, talk to us a little bit about that Romeo and Juliet influence that Abner was just talking about. So uh, for our audience who may not know this, each of the three episodes has a line taken from uh, Shakespeare's play, Romeo and Juliet. So uh, which which part should they be listening for? What line uh, is from Romeo and Juliet? Sure, there's a um, trio, a trio at the end or just before the end um, where, she, where she is watching, Alma's watching this kind of meeting of the, these two other people. And um, the line that we took from the Romeo and Juliet is, um, uh, the first line is not in the lyric, but the second line is a couplet. Can I go forward? Well, actually, I think it is. In Can I go forward when my heart is here? Turn back dull earth and find th thy center out. And the turn back dull earth, you'll hear over and over and over again. Um, um, it's a really beautiful trio that Avner wrote. Um, and then the title comes from, um, and, and that is in, um, Act two, um, act two, I think. Um, the title is from My Love is as Boundless as the Sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, that trio moment is, is a really beautiful moment as uh, at their, they're at the wedding where uh, Luke is, is finally introduced to Sophie by Alma. Uh, and, and it's kind of this like inner uh, turmoil for him, isn't it, about, about meeting this, this younger woman? For all of them. For, yeah really, because they all kind of understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Could you talk to us just uh, real quickly about, there's a duet in the middle section. I think before we get to the trio, there's a duet uh -huh. in the middle section and, and the, the poetry there is, is just beautiful, Stephanie. Uh, the, the more we give, the more we have, uh, boundless as the sea. Um, uh, and then, and Avner, the music there is, is really chromatic kind of descending phrases. Uh, can, can the two of you talk about how you, how you crafted that duet and, and Avner specifically kind of how that chromaticism feels a little bit different from the rest of, from the rest of the episode? Well, do you remember our process on that? If we had a lot of back and forth, I don't, I mean, probably you, uh, there, you and, brought in some repetition there, but I don't remember. I think you wrote, I think you wrote it. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I think you just wrote it. I agree that it's a, be that it's beautiful poetry. And it, it spoke to me. Um, like, I think we were, I think most of our back and forth had to do with making sure that all of the story makes sense without, you know, without, without having an hour to tell it. So like we were, yeah. we kind of went back and forth and like, like what do I need? To, what do I need to do in the music so the director can do something else with a with the camera to show X, Y, or Z, and like add uh, uh, um, you know the the uh, stage directions or the, the like. The, I think a lot was, but I don't remember asking you to change anything in that in that duet. I think it was just the way you wrote it, yeah. um, if I remember correctly. I, I can really speak about the. Do. I can speak about the musical aspect. It's, it's actually quite. Um, I'm quite happy that you can tell that it's different. Please do, yeah. Um, cool. So a, a little bit of of, of tr tr trick, like tricks of the trade here. Um, that duet is is very expressive and kind of uh, melodic, but it's actually built like a, a, a of a twelve tone row, uh, based on the Schoenberg system, and and exactly on the, his idea of dividing that row into two parts. And having like one hexachord and that's so six notes for one singer and six one notes for the other singer. And so that's that's actually how that duet is is structured. Like each one of them uses a set of interval that they repeat, even, even when they move to other notes, but they never actually overlap. So when they do a counterpoint, still each one of them is like in their own world. And and my idea yeah. was that this is the duet when they're, you know, he wants to have a child, and she says, This is not gonna happen. And I think that's like the moment where they realize that they actually live in different realities. And so, and, and that's, I think part of why this duet is more chromatic is because I actually use all the 12 pitches uh, quite extensively because that's, yeah. that's how that system works, so. Oh, that's fantastic, yeah. So all of our audience members watching tonight, listen for that duet in the second scene when they're, it's in the middle moment when they're talking about that. It's uh, I, I heard that and I knew that there was gonna be a great story behind that music and that poetry there. Uh, well, th this has been fabulous to get to know the first episode. Uh, I wish we had even more time to talk about it. We're gonna move on to our second episode. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, thank you. for joining us. Uh, we'll see you back here again before we start. But now uh, let's bring on librettist John Grimmett to talk with us about episode two, also composed by Avner. Uh, and episode two is titled Now. Welcome, John. Hi, Jeremy, glad to be here. Glad to have you. Uh, so same question for the first one. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you became a, a writer and librettist. Well, uh, I became an opera librettist by accident, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I grew up playing trombone and uh, went to school, uh, to college at the University of Houston. I'm from the Houston area. I grew up uh, in a suburb called Alvin. And um, I, I went to the University of Houston to study music education. I was going to be uh, a, a band director at uh, a high school or a junior high. And uh, about my junior year, I uh, got really interested in theater. And around that time, uh, my academic advisor said, uh, there's this guy who's coming to teach playwriting. Uh, you might uh, have heard of him. His name is Edward Albee. And I said, no, I hadn't heard of him because I didn't know anything about theater. <laughs> but he was <laughs> teaching... Uh, playwriting, and it was actually his last uh, two years he taught at the University of Houston. I became a student. And um, because of that, that completely transformed my life, and I wanted to write musical theater. 
uh, and uh, I ended up moving to New York and I attended the graduate musical theater writing program at NYU. And uh, one night in my first year, there one of the professors there, Randall Ng, uh, who's also an opera composer, said, why don't you come to this recital uh, with me uh, where Jake Heggie is playing? And I had met, met Jake a few years prior, actually at an HGO production of uh, Dead Man Walking. And Jake is one of the most generous souls uh, on this planet. And uh, I wrote to him like at this email out of the blue when I was in Houston, where I said, uh, would you, you know, do you have any time to kind of talk to me? And we met over at a Barnes and Noble in, uh, in the office Shepherd, you know, and we talked about opera for, you know, an hour or two. It's such, just how generous Jake is. And so I had met him before and uh, I end up going to this recital back in the old Opera America building back before they have their beautiful new recital hall now. Um, and uh, I wrote him an email after the recital because uh, at the time I think he was working on Moby Dick or Moby Dick had just premiered. And I said, it was so wonderful to hear your music and see you again. And he said, well, listen, they're starting this program at Washington National Opera called the American Opera Initiative. And um, have you ever written any libretto, uh, libretti before? And I said, no, uh, what is a libretti? You know, <laughs> I didn't, uh, I was so uninformed. You know, I had appreciated opera. I played in the opera orchestras um, before, but I had never uh, really dissected um, the form and the structure of opera. And so uh, Jake was really instrumental in putting me together with a composer named Liam Wade. Uh, and we were in the first class of the American Opera Initiative at Washington National Opera. And uh, we wrote a comedy, uh, which is hard to do. And I, that's where I met Mark Campbell. Um, and we, you know, I made a lot of great connections over uh, the years and kept writing opera. And I had two pieces that were um, performed by uh, Fort Worth Opera. They, they were selected. They, they had a program called the Frontiers Program, which was a competition. And I had two pieces, both with Houston composers. Um, uh, one is named Charlie Halka, who I believe has since relocated to the Pacific Northwest. But Charlie and I wrote uh, an opera that was selected called And Jill Came Tumbling After. And, um, and then another one with uh, Daniel Zajcek called Nothing in the Nothingness, uh, which was a, and both of these are small form operas. And that was really, uh, shepherded by a great genius in mind, uh, Darren K. Woods, who is now a part of Siegel Colony, um, and, and really a, a proponent of new American opera. And so I, I, I really stumbled into this by accident, uh, but it has been a wonderful um, profession and a wonderful thing that I am now a, uh, I teach at a, a high school in a suburb of Houston called Pearland, and um, not a day goes by uh, that I don't, uh, I continue to write, of course, but I direct, I produce, I oversee a, a program with uh, over 200 students. Uh, we do six shows a year. And so um, it's good to be back in Houston. We move, uh, my husband and I moved back uh, several years ago uh, to be closer to family. So. Okay. Well, that's great. You wear many, many different hats. Uh, and <laughs> besides this one. Besides so, yeah. Yeah. That one. <laughs> interestingly, for this episode, uh, you wore two different ones. You were a librettist and, uh, and film director. Um, tell us a little bit about, so, so let's start with John. Tell us a little bit about how you balance those two roles between librettist and film director. You know, how did you start? Did you kind of start with the visuals or did you start with the words on the page? And then Avner, uh, uh, tell us about the difference between the two projects where uh, in the first one, you had a librettist and a, a different film director. And in this one, they were one and the same. It, it was, that, was it a different process for you in terms of composing the music as well? So to answer your question about um, being a librettist and being a director, uh, there are two different hats that you wear. Um, in terms of parts of your brain, if you think of it in terms of right brain or left brain, the creative acts and, and the way that, you know, I was trained uh, by Edward was uh, the 
the act of conceiving is a visual, auditory, and, and tactile medium. You have to see what it is that you're you're writing, and and uh, when you hand it, how specific you are. And if you've ever read an, a play by Edward Albee, you know it's punctuation. He considered himself a composer. You know, a pun punctuation is used the way that we use dynamics or articulation marks. And um, he was very specific in his way that he would hand off a script to a director to be, um, you know, interpreted. And that was something that, you know, was probably influenced heavily by Samuel Beckett and some of these other people of, of the early 20th century. And um, for me, interpreting my own work is probably one of the most difficult things because if I don't like what I'm seeing, I have every right to change it because I wrote it, right, uh, with, with Abner. And it can get confusing and it can get uh, uh, too many conceptual layers on top of each other if you aren't careful. And so you kind of always have to play this duality of, am I being the writer or am I being the director? Um, because I do think that they are different muscles that you have to exert uh, during the creative process. Did that affect your composition much, Avner? Uh, between the two episodes, was it a different process? I I I, I would say I, I don't think so. Like the, it was a little different because you know it's a different story, and I wrote different music, and we had different fingers, <laughs> so like things were different. But I I don't think they had that had to do with the fact that John wrote and directed i think um i think that might have like made it a bit simpler for him to think about the the libretto but but i for me it's it's um for me it's a very it, it was not that was not a that was not a difference i think in rehearsals we made a couple changes like we added some words or changed some words i don't remember exactly what it was um and I think that might have been easier because John was wearing both of these hats at the time. But I have to say, I don't think that, first of all, I don't think that I had any any back and forth with John. I think I got the text and I was like, okay, let's go. <laughs> there, there was one back and forth. Uh, <laughs> one that, thing. That I hope I don't embarrass you when I do. <laughs> but I, I was looking over my notes because, you know, we all write many different pieces uh, between now and the three years ago. That So I'm going through all these old emails and I find this one from Abner and he goes, I love this, I love this, but I really want to cut this line. And I wrote him back and I said, that is fine with me, but that's the line that Shakespeare wrote, uh, that the whole play is based about. <laughs> yes, I was like, it doesn't feel like it's the same person who wrote this line. <laughs> So, so uh, what what is that line from the Shakespeare that our audience should listen for? So, uh, just to give you a little bit of context about episode two, uh, episode two is based on um, a, a, a true story um, of a uh, woman who is in a relationship with her husband, who admits to her that she that he is. Uh, about to undergo a gender transition. And um, the line, knowing just that uh, prior to interviewing the subject, uh, the line that stuck out to me was, under love's heavy burden, do I sink? Uh, because there is a complication uh, in, in talking to this uh, person uh, which was a privilege and honor to get to do uh, working on this piece, that um, there were there were so many complications that she struggled to convey um, with her own marriage and and the man she fell in love with, the person she fell in love with, reconciling her own desires and her own wants. And uh, they, they ended up having uh, two children prior to this announcement. So there was also the lives of, of children involved um, and, and how that would affect them. And so it was a very, very complex situation. And, and at the end of the day, the one thing that I will say about our subject is that she loved uh, her marriage, you know, until there was a point where she could no longer participate in it. And um, under love's heavy burden, do I sink? 
means something contextually very different in the the scope of Romeo and Juliet. But uh, for this, it was kind of the the entire crux of our piece. So hmm. it was a nice line. Yeah, I'm glad we didn't cut it. <laughs> <laughs> so there. There are there's so many different transition experiences uh, that each individual and each couple goes through. And I, I know during the process, uh, you want to be uh, really sensitive to that and really honor uh, that multiplicity of, of possibilities and experiences. Could you talk to us a little bit about that and how you approach that? Sure. Um, I will say that uh, this piece was written, you know, I remember Jeremy at the beginning of the broadcast, he said, oh, well, uh, a lot of people might think that uh, we created these videos to respond to the pandemic, but we were doing it ahead of our time. And that's really what, what I'm proudest of in this piece and working with Houston Grand Opera, because around this time, there are several pieces being written in the country uh, for transgender singers. And um, at my own school where I teach at the high school, I have transgender students who are about to enter into a world uh, where there aren't opportunities or pieces uh, written for them that exist outside of a binary. And so um, I am a, a member of the LGBTQ plus community, but I am not transgender. And so I needed to do my due diligence in, in really having those conversations in safe spaces with, uh, with our performer, Lucia, who is one of, every time I think about Lucia, there's this warm, warm sensation that overcomes me because she's so wonderful in how she guided us through the process. We could ask her any question. We could tackle any sort of difficulty. Um, and she was there to be a resource to not only her own experience, but the experiences that affect so many uh, young transgender uh, people. And we wanted to make sure that that the characters that we portrayed were not uh, caricatures, they were not symbols, they were not representations, um, but they were honoring uh, the long legacy of transgender people in our existence. And what we wanted to do was give them visibility in an art form uh, that is not necessarily one that, that has lent a lens to to that before, and uh, one that going into the future has said, hey, we're gonna make space for you because we value your contributions, we value who you are, and we want you to be a part of this. And to me, that sort of sense of inclusion um, was what drew me most to the process. And so I'm I'm very grateful uh, for the experience. It changed It changed me. Um, uh, and it, I, I would hope that those who, who look at the piece will look at it and watch it. And if they get to the end and they're scratching their heads, but they're moved, they go back and watch it again. Because that was another thing that we had talked about is, um, in 12 minutes, there's no way that you can possibly grasp all the complications that people do. And that's what is, that's what we discovered in this this art form is that, um, or in this medium rather, is that it allows people to go back and re-experience and it allows them to go back and have a different experience the second yeah. time and a third and a fourth. And so- What else can they find every time they watch it? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, John and Avner. Uh, this was amazing. Again, I wish we could talk all night about getting to know it, but we're, we are going to eventually get to watch all of these. Uh, thanks so much, both of you, for, for joining us. Uh, now, uh, for our last guest for the pre-show event, uh, composer and co-librettist for episode three, uh, please welcome Kamala Shankaram. Hi. Hi, Kamala. Welcome. Nice to see you. You too. I'm, I'm so excited to finally get a chance to sit down and really talk to you. We've met kind of fleetingly over the last couple of years, but I'm, I'm excited to get to know more about you. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you became a composer? Sure. I mean, it was kind of an accident, <laughs> to be honest. Um, 
that I, I always studied music. I, um, I wrote songs for myself starting uh, at a very young age and then arranged things for my choir when I was in high school. But um, I, you know, there was no plan for formal composition lessons or anything like that. But then um, I ended up in New York because I thought I wanted to be a Broadway performer. And um, I came to Sarah Lawrence College because they sent me a postcard that said you are different so are we and I thought I am and I just, <laughs> that was it so I, I came to New York and that was where I learned about contemporary music and opera because many of my professors at Sarah Lawrence were in the Philip Glass Ensemble and so I was introduced to contemporary music new music at an early age and I took composition lessons with uh, Chet Biscardi and Catherine Hoover and George Santakis and so I thought I might want to be a composer but I was not supposed to be because uh, you know my father is from South India and I was supposed to become a doctor or a lawyer or something more practical like that. So uh, graduating from Sarah Lawrence and very much in debt when he offered to pay for grad school if I did not go for music, I agreed <laughs> because uh, it made sense. So I actually have a doctorate in cognitive psychology and not right. music. Yeah, um, but I while I was in grad school, I continued. I, I was a, a performer, a singer, and I, I continued writing, and that's probably why my doctorate took so long to finish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that that sort of the, the the turning point for me really came um, when I had just finished doing a tour with the Worcester Group, which is an avant-garde theater company based here in, in New York, and a friend of mine whose partner was was the general manager for the Worcester Group said you know, the Here Arts Center has these residency programs. If you really want to make narrative pieces, which I had started uh, fooling around with, I made these um, song cycles with video that I would play with a band around in clubs around Brooklyn. Um, he said, you know, you might try applying for this residency. And so I did. And, and here kind of held my hand through the process of making a theater piece. Um, and then I, I, you know, with taking a real chance and made this this crazy theater piece on a shoestring budget and it sold out and got a rave New York Times review and that was kind of the, the beginning. So I guess I, I have a very sideways <laughs> way of becoming a cup composer. That's fantastic. I bet uh, uh, the psychology doctor helps in the rehearsal room, doesn't it? Yes, <laughs> and, and in other places too, which we, we won't talk about. <laughs> Well, so this story, um, like the other two, is also based on a true story. Um, could you tell us about how the story came to your attention? Yes. So uh, I had worked with H.G. Oko previously for the Opera to Go program. I made a piece with librettist J David Johnston called Monkey and Francine in the City of Tigers. And that piece uh, drew from many of the communities around Houston, including uh, Indian music and West African music and inspired by uh, monkey stories from many different cultures. Uh, so this story, I think, came from uh, the Opera to Go. I think it was in a mall that <laughs> y'all were collecting stories from people. And the, this this story came from a young Indian woman named, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to tell you, tell you her name, but Sneha. I won't tell you her last name. Uh, so Sneha had this the story that you know is very grounded in, in some of the issues that uh, South Asians face. And so Emily and Carlene reached out to me to see if I might be interested in uh, writing the music and collaborating on the libretto. Um, so that's really where it came from. But just like the other stories that that we have talked about this evening, it's really about um, the sort of varieties of love and how people negotiate those relationships. So in this case, uh, Sneha comes from a caste called the Kashmiri Pandit, which is very high caste. And then being in the US, um, she sort of fell in love with this guy who's eight years younger than she is and of a lower caste. And so this is the two things, right, that are, that are um, not working in her favor is that she's older and she's of a very different cast. Um, oh no, sorry, the, the the husband is a, she's Gujarati and he's a Kashmiri pundit. So he's the higher cast. And so um, his parents 
did not approve at all and did not want them to get married to the point where um, they actually didn't invite his parents to their wedding. Um, that's all sort of background because when we talked to her, Misha and I, um, she told us this crazy story about how neither of them had realized that they needed to have flowers for the actual ceremony because it was kind of a DIY ceremony, you know, nothing very expensive and nothing, you know, they had a friend who was going to be the priest for them. And there are these flower garlands that you're supposed to put on, on each other as part of the ceremony and they just didn't think about it. So the day of the wedding, they actually had to run out through Houston trying to find some kind of flowers to make these garlands and so that's that's really what the central story of our opera is but then undergirded by these these differences in cast and uh, parents not approving and, and all of that yeah so so when uh, when we hear the two singers talking about uh, the different cast systems that's for our audience that's that's what they're talking about there exactly. they're from different cast levels yeah 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 um so the, you were talking about the the roses uh, and and the, there's there's kind of a I don't know I just to myself I kind of call it the flower motif the flower store motif that comes in on the strings uh, it's at the beginning and then again when when she when Sneha the character remembers like oh yeah but there's this other place we could go to to get the flowers um, there's something about it that sounds really familiar um, could you talk to us about that that theme that motif that you reuse uh, for the flower shop. Sure. I mean, one of the things that I was playing around with in this piece is, um, and, and I've played around with it in other pieces as well, is how to combine the, the Hindustani raga system with uh, European classical music. Because in Indian music, you don't have harmonic progression the way that you do in European classical music. So one thing that, that is interesting is to take this thematic material and then what does that sound like if you place it into a different raga? So the, rather than progressing through chords, you're progressing through ragas and that slightly changes the character of the piece. So we start in one raga and we go to a different raga in the middle um, and then we end in another raga and yeah. that they're, they're like slightly the same, but not, not entirely. Yeah. Just real quick, um, uh, and I know it's much more complicated than than <laughs> we have time for. But could you try to give our audience, you know, a, a few sentence explanation of the raga system and sure. and how it's different from uh, the Western European music theory? Yeah. So we, again, this is sort of like very oversimplified, but I think yeah. it helps to remember that the word raga means color. So it's a way of coloring the sound and it's about the relationships of the notes to each other rather than just what the notes are. So in, in European classical music, we basically have two modes, which are major or minor. Um, but if you go back to like Greek music, you have many different modes where the relationships between the pitches are, are, are not the same from one mode to another. So that's part of it. But then also you may use different pitches in ascending passages versus descending passages. There are certain notes that are meant to be emphasized. There are characteristic phrases that you use to sort of give a flavor of the raga. They're meant to be performed at a certain time of day in order to really capture what the characteristic of the raga is. So it's very much about a world of musical sound and color um, rather than just a scale. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And you, <laughs> said your, you said uh, your father is South Indian. Uh, yes. So are the ragas that you use uh, in the piece, are the, the ragas that did you, did you perhaps grew up with, are they more South Indian than North Indian? <laughs> no. no? <laughs> That's the sad thing. Is, um, so I actually trained in Hindustani music because um, when I went to India as an adult for the first time, my grandfather learned, he, he found out that I had been studying your European classical music and piano and, and uh, singing. And he decided I should learn Indian music. So he wanted to give me an instrument to take back to New York to learn on. And in South India, that would be the Veena. But the Veena is gigantic. So he decided it would be better to give me a sitar because it's smaller and you can actually carry it on a plane. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the so the musical influence is, is a more Northern Indian raga. Um, yes. Could you talk to us uh, a little bit about uh, the vocal stylings of uh, of 
uh, excuse me, I'm forgetting the, the male characters, Sid's, of Sid's Sid. parents. Yeah. Yes. So this is something um, that doing it in this format really made possible because um, the, the Hindustani and even the Carnatic, the South Indian vocal tradition um, is not as loud <laughs> as the operatic singing. And so, you know, if you were going to try and put Hindustani singers on a stage with opera singers, you would run into all of these balance issues. But because we were going to be doing it in this video format, um, I thought, well, why don't we see what happens if we cast some of these characters as Hindustani? Hindustani singers. And so Sid's parents are played by a pundit who actually lives in Houston and runs a school for Hindustani music. Um, and so they are trained Hindustani singers, which which is really only possible because, uh, because of the format that we were doing this in, which is really great. Oh, that's so interesting. That's great. Well, I hope our audience uh, keeps an ear out for all of those influences as we watch this episode tonight. Uh, real quick, let's just bring all of our creators back on. Uh, Stephanie, Avner, and John uh, to join me and Kamala as we wrap up tonight's pre-show event. Uh, I, I fortunately got to to go late because we're we're just we're doing the videos onto this stream. All, all of my other pre-shows I would have had to end precisely at 7:30 so that nobody misses anything. But uh, such a such a thrill to be able to talk with all of you tonight. Uh, thank you so much for your work and, and pioneering this new medium. And and thank you for being with us tonight. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you. you. All right, now we are uh, we are past our 7.30 time. So thank you to our audience. Uh, stay tuned right here on this stream uh, for episode one, Boundless, music by Avner Dorman, libretto by Stephanie Fleischman. Following episode one, we'll take a brief intermission with an intermission feature hosted by Carlene Graham, director of HGO Co. and Emily Wells, senior producing manager of HGO Co. and the series producer of Star-Crossed web series. Uh, interviewing uh, two of the three filmmakers, the third uh, actually in film filming tonight, so couldn't couldn't join uh, John Grimmett and then Misha Penton. Uh, thank you everyone for joining me for the pre-show event, and please enjoy episode one of Starcrossed.
Of course I do. Then turn around and walk away from me.
Oh dear. Oh. Hey, Emily, are you coming in? Anyway, we're just uh, a lot of fun <laughs> revisiting that uh, show after a while. It was, oh it brought back gosh. an enormous amount of memories. Yes, for sure. It was so fun to see that again. Boy, it's been almost two, three years since we released the first episode. I know. I'm and switching it, because I'm having some audio difficulty here. Can no you hear worries. me? Yeah, I can hear you okay. No yes, for sure. It was so fun to see that again. Boy, it's been almost two, three years. I think years I'm since experiencing we a delay. Episode, I know. So, and, I'm switching because um, I'm having some audio sorry. difficulty here. I'm hearing That's okay. a you know, delay in the Yeah, audio. I can hear you okay. I'm going to put headphones in. Yes, right for sure. It was so fun to see that again. Great. So while Carlene gets her audio set up, uh, I just want to thank reiterate Jeremy's thanks of our uh, composers and librettists for joining us in the pre-show conversation. There were some things that surprised me even. Uh, even after producing all three episodes and and being so closely tied to the process, I think Carlene, there were some probably some surprises there for you too. Oh, I think we've lost Carlene again. Well, I think uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, John Grimmett and Misha Penton to join us here in the stream while we wait for Carlene to get her feed refreshed. Um, I'm just curious for both of you, what what comes to mind see, watching that first episode, knowing what your journeys were like with episodes two and three, what moments surprised you? What, what sort of captivated you watching that again for the first time in a long time? Um, for me, it was... Um, really interesting because I know um, the singers pretty well. Um, so that was fun to watch them again. And uh, I even knew some of the other people um, who were not singing. And, I, and, I'm, <laughs> and I've and I've known, and I've, 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 right, exactly. And I've watched their careers um, over the, you know, the course of time. Um, it, it, I don't know. It's really interesting to watch it because I've seen it, but it's been a long time since I've seen it. Mm -hmm. And um, so you always see something new when you come back to a work. Um, something that really struck me about it was the beautiful um, exterior uh, shots and the um, and really just how poignant the story is and yeah. moving. And and I think it really it really captures. It really captured that for me. Yeah. For John, anything jump out for you watching that first episode again? I think that, um, you know, I'm obsessed with transitions. So it's <laughs> like, I'm always, I'm always, now that I've, I, I remember watching the piece the first time and really appreciating it. And now that I, I get to enjoy these pieces again and again, I'm, I'm wondering like, how did they do that? You know, because I have Ooh. my, I have my experience from episode two that I know all of the ins and outs and the intricacies, but, uh, but it's really, really something to know that some of those scenes were shot, you know, <laughs> not on the same day or weeks after or. In the same day. Definitely. In um, the same day. <laughs> right. There was definitely oh, yeah. some coverage that was captured in North Carolina um, after the fact. And that was one of the big things that we learned from episode one going on to two and three is making sure that every single measure of music had what they call coverage in the film industry, which is surprising for those of us who are in opera and live theater. We don't think about having to find ways to cover transitions like that. Carlene, anything jump out to you watching oh that my first gosh. episode well, again? It was like the entire HGO Co staff was in that show. Yes. Which I can take 
take great joy in. I mean, I just, I think of all the back behind the scenes and stuff and, and it was just, you know, it was just, it's such a labor of love. I mean, this whole epic, this whole trilogy has been a labor of love. And, you know, it was something that we had really no idea what we were getting ourselves into. And um, each, each episode was a new adventure and just, you know, it's just, it, it's just really moving and to get to visit it. It's like a little reunion, you know, it's uh, yeah, yeah. just lovely to get to see everyone oh. again. And so John, it's great to see you again. And Misha, it's great to see you. Welcome into our little party. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, Carlene. And nice to see uh, John. I haven't met you in real life. So yes. Oh, well, Misha, cool. I remember seeing a piece of yours years ago. Uh, you were you were doing a a, a one man or a one woman show of uh, uh, Dominic Dominic Diorio uh, a piece, and I actually brought Edward Albee to that piece. Yeah. We enjoyed it quite I, a bit. Thank so. you. I re I do remember um, Mr. Albee's presence. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't? Oh my God. One would ex one would expect. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so it, it, it's good, and I appreciated it's watching right. your your work on episode three. So and you and and likewise for sure. Well, I just you know I I'm so curious, Emily. If you if you don't have a specific question right now, unless you no, I, go for it. Grant, I'm just really curious, um, Misha. Um, in terms of filmmaking, I know you're. You know, this was. Um, knowing we brought you in because you know we were a fan of the work you were doing and i'm just curious as to if you could talk a little bit about your process uh for filmmaking especially when there's music live music and you know classical and operatic uh music yeah um thanks um my own work is uh very film-based i put out a number of albums and music films and music video is one of my big passions and um and i'm a classically trained singer um and uh, i also had the pleasure of editing um uh, the episode arose yes. so um it was really um a great opportunity for me in a lot of ways um i work very um intuitively and m sort of manically um, and both Emily and Carlene really um, were very generous in their support of my process. Um, and, and at the same time, I learned a lot about um, how I wanted to, to, um, to create something or, or to collaborate on something that had a much, um, uh, a much more structure um, in terms of narrative than uh, I'm a, my own work is quite abstract and non-narrative. So um, I kind of went back in a lot of ways to my earlier theater days. I'm trained as a, a theater artist as well. Um, I know we all have these very uh, eclectic backgrounds. So I, I join all of you in that. Um, so that was my experience. Um, it was it was really exciting. We uh, we actually ran into some really bad weather, um, not quite as bad uh, as we just had, but similar. We had this crazy oh, Arctic it blast. Was, it was pretty close. Yeah, yeah. in we were below uh, freezing. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. there were these sort of Hollywood kind of challenges, you know, to to the filmmaking of it. Um, and then we ended up with some really beautiful days at Herman Park, um, mm -hmm. which were just exquisite, and the colors were just um, so vibrant. And I'm I'm a very um, sort of super visual person uh, compositionally as well. So so that the beauty of the setting, um, particularly that day at Herman Park, um, was really exquisite. Yeah. And, and that draws me too. I mean, if you had to share, um, if what, what do you recall from the film in, in, in terms of what were visual themes for you, Misha, as a director for this, for, for episode number three, what was, uh, what were your visual themes? Um, I really pay a lot of attention to sort of the, 
movement and the tableau aspect of of, um, of the of the direction in terms of the way things are composed in the in the frame. Mm -hmm. um, the colors were really so much more even saturated than I expected. So that was really yeah. super exciting. Um, I was really um, intent on that sort of, there's a dr kind of a dream sequence where uh, Sneha, the main female character has this extended sort of monologue. Um, and that's when we also see the beautiful uh, traditional South Indian singing. Um, so weaving this other world into the real world, um, that was really fun to do. And it, and it kind of pulled on my strengths also, that yeah. otherworldliness is kind of um, what c excites me um, about film and performance, so. Oh, I remember, great. Misha, when we were filming the final moments on the bridge there at Buffalo Bayou Park, and we were like waiting for just a tiny glimpse of sunlight because the whole episode is just infused with this light and sparkle, which is really lovely. And so I remember that day, we were just like, okay, just like, 10 minutes of sun, that's all we need. It's just enough to, to get a little spotlight on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You really start to appreciate kind of like just the moment that you need. And I, and I think of that in, the, in major motion pictures. I think of what is gone through to get just that, oh. the, the moment. And also how lucky you can be in just, you know, um, because the aerial shot, the drone shot, Ooh. We were quite lucky the way the wind was blowing the rose petals. Um, and uh, so there's a, a lot of serendipitous <laughs> stuff. And, and I, I kind of tend to rely on that maybe a, a little too much. But um, well, and especially when you're on a budget, serendipity on a budget is magic. Yeah, <laughs> right, well, right, right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I know our, our, our viewers will uh, have those wonderful things to look forward to in episode three. So thank you, Misha. And John, I'd like to know for yourself, what were your visual themes? We talked to you a little bit about your libretto writing, but in the first segment, but you know, if you could talk a little bit about, cause the visual themes in your, in episode two are vastly different from the three. I mean, the three shows are very different but visually your film is extremely different in, in, in color and in, in the use of color. So I'm curious what your, what your, what was going on in terms of what, you know, your visual goals and themes. So uh, in the film, it's the use of black and white versus color. And uh, you know, I think it plays upon a trope or an attitude that black and white occurs in the past. You know, it's a delineation of time, past and present, right? Um, and really the piece is called Now because it, it focuses kind of on these three moments of then, now, and next, right? So the characters say, what happens next? The world passes, right? And after that line is sung, everything is different, nothing has changed. Or in the first case uh, of these two relationships, nothing is different, everything has changed, right? Um, and so we're playing with, with just simply the transposition of words within the librettos and how those, uh, those tr that transposition means something different in the context of each moment. So what does color and what does uh, black and white mean? Well, I think that the impetus was to shoot it in a way to make the viewer think that black and white was then and color is now. But really, um, the change to color is to signify a difference that a spirit is awakening, right? Uh, that, that you're living your true self or that you're being your true identity. And so there is a, a, a couplet, uh, 
a stanza in the piece that says, love can change as long as we allow for that was then and this is now. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the bridge between time and awakening that cool. the piece takes. Um, and, and that was the visual theme. There is a, a tube of lipstick in the, uh, that Lucia picks up and, and she's in black and white. And when she rolls the tube of lipstick, it's in bright red. And so that contrast is to show, and as she puts it on, it's to show that she is not only existent, but very much alive uh, in the discovery of who she actually is. Mm. It's really beautiful. And Emily, any questions for our creators? We actually, we have a, a question from the chat, Carlene, and it's really Ooh. for you. Oh, and it's cool. the question that is on everyone's mind tonight, I know. <laughs> and the question is, at some point in the future, post pandemic, will HGO Co be continuing this series or visit <sighs> other themes with similar video pieces? Why, of course. <laughs> <laughs> And anyone who would like to, to financially help make that happen, you can contact us because we would be delighted to continue this because it, it has been a, um, it, it's been a labor of love and to honestly come back and visit everyone and, and just reminisce and to be able to, you know, anticipate watching episode two and three here shortly. It's just been a joy. Honestly, it has been the bright, bright part of my week. And I'm, um, you know, and I have to say, Emily, this would not have happened without you as the producer of this series, you know, um, and managing everything for this, you know, this is this is a real, I really want to, I need to give you a shout out for this because, you know, you really made this happen. And um, and I, I really want to acknowledge that. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so it. much, Carlene. I love this project so much that I kept one of the sets from episode two. <laughs> uh, John pointed out that I'm coming to you live from one of the sets for episode two. We, so you we can shot kind of look for that. We shot episode two in Emily's house. That's how dedicated of a producer she was. But I, I, I do want to say that, uh, you know, as somebody who produces theater and Misha, you can chime in as well. This is such a worthy investment uh, because our world uh, post pandemic is not going to look the same uh, right. that it did prior to. And HGO is really ahead of its time in making these videos. Um, and not only using these videos to explore a new medium, but to give a platform to voices that have traditionally not been given a platform in the art form. And that's really the investment that, you know, we've heard for tens of hundreds of years that, oh, how is opera going to survive? How is opera going to survive? Opera will survive because its audiences, as somebody who's worked in the musical theater as well, Musical theater audiences are actually tend to be more conservative than some of the opera audiences, which I it was a huge shock to me. Uh, you know, being a lot of a uh, part of these new opera initiatives, uh, there are people who are out there who are hungry for for new work, and and it does take an investment on behalf of a community. Um, but Houston is is such a, a wonderfully diverse place. Um, it is a place where we have literally every type of, of ethnicity and uh, religion and belief and culture. And it really is an important part of the work of this company to, to give that back to the community. And uh, really, I feel so passionate about this one piece. So if you're out there and you're just sitting on a couple of dollars, consider <laughs> giving it. Thank to you. The grand oh opera. <laughs> well, I know, I, I know an advancement department who may be calling to hire you. <laughs> uh, um, I just wanted to share a little bit, John, your, your words are so eloquent all the time. And I, I think about going back to starting these two episodes because we started these two sort of as a set almost mm -hmm. after the first one we approached we found the stories 
and we started looking for our, our complementary creative teams and things like that. But I wonder for both of you, what was the first image that you had mm. when the text was written and the music was workshopped and finalized and ready to go? What was the very first image you saw in, your, in, in the cinema of your mind? Um, what's the first picture that you saw? I, I think for me, um, it, it is that dream monologue, um, section where Sneha has all these lights that are twinkling in this like bouquet, um, uh, fuzzy background and, mm -hmm. um, and, and, Actually, there is a, a bit that was in the trailer, I think, and, and not in the final, but they're standing with the umbrella and the roses are falling from heaven upon mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, that drone shot at the end, I, I have to <laughs> mention it again, but it's so, it's so beautiful. They're promenading um, with each other with the roses. So that this is that sort of feeling of being showered in love, really, mm -hmm. um, through adversity. And mm -hmm. you love who you love, right? Um, so yeah, that was, that's kind of, for me, that was sort of those, those kinds of images. Mm -hmm. John? I think for me, this piece was always about finding uh, magic in the mundane. And, uh, you know, I feel that oftentimes in going to the theater, we expect something overly extraordinary to happen, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the great part about film is that uh, the extraordinary lies in the small details. And for me, that was, in, in this piece directly, it was always about authenticity because that was the heart of the show, of being who you truly were and being accepted or loved or being who you were and on that journey of being loved. It didn't matter if you were uh, Lucia's character or if you were uh, the other two characters in the piece. They, they also had to seek authenticity. And I remember this one moment um, where we were filming and we were upstairs all of us were upstairs in the in scene, that room in the room in right that, there <laughs> in the scene where uh, Joey uh, and Lucia were on the bed, and I told them, I said, Lucia, I want you to essentially come out to Joey and uh, tell him that you are transgender, and so we took we shot the scene I think twice or maybe even, actually, I think it was probably just once. Uh, but we were sitting there, and I remember sitting behind the scene, behind the camera and watching. And at the end of it, I looked around. I hadn't realized I had been crying. And I looked around, and everyone else was crying because it was so authentic. And it was just a small moment. And um, I think that in the times that we live in now where connection is so needed and it will be gained once again and it will be celebrated um that sort of thing is something i will cling to mm. really so thank you for that experience oh well it thank you and you know i think we we want to <laughs> The less is always an appearance. Um, that's okay. We love it. Um, and so we thank you so much. It's lovely to have some time to chat about these great projects again. And without further ado, we will go right into episode two, followed immediately by episode three. Enjoy.
best thing you Was that you there? Was that you there? Was it you that I could always see? Back when you were he, and that now you are she. Where are we now? Passion on your lips Not so long ago The sun refused to set you You in all my thoughts You in all my dreams You in all my days Is it you there? Is it you I'm looking for? Is it you there? Is it you I'm looking for? And you and me and you and we and you and me and you.
everything is different nothing has changed this is
said just flowers will do. Where can you find a hundred roses at night on a Saturday? I'm looking at Yelp.
Do you remember when we first met? That stupid movie! Deli Belly! You stood out from all the other girls. I thought you were too young. But I persisted. You did, but I pushed you away. I had given up. And then on the trip to Chicago, Carlene, so much fun. What fun oh, on memory God. lane. That just actually made my whole night. That was just, I, uh, you know, you and I were texting during and talking about how much that, I mean, how beautiful the music is for um, all three shows and uh, just, I, you know, and just so much, it was just, it brought back so much to watch. Uh, John, what was it like to see your film again? Well, I'm going to tell you, I watched it uh, earlier today because uh -huh. I I wanted to be able to put myself back into where I was when we made it. Um, but watching it again, it was just, I, I remember there's this one shot of, of Joey sitting on the edge of the bed and the camera pulling back. And I remember that Sean had to make this track that the camera moved back on. And you know something just so small like that. Uh, it was just. It goes back to what I was saying earlier about transitions. You know, um, I, I remember how we put it all together, and it's just kind of incredible that um, that I know that y'all were y'all were talking about the weather on certain days uh, of of the other film. You know, and and remembering little details like that that the audience doesn't necessarily get to see. But we remember it, it just brought me Mr. back to a very 
viscerally, right. Yeah. And a, a very, a very specific time and place that was really kind of lovely reliving that again. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Oh, please. And Misha, what's it like to see your, your work again? You know, it, I hope everyone who was watching had all three episodes, Boundless Now and Arose, had tissues and, you know, like the, the emotional spectrum. Yeah. Sorry, the arms. emotional spectrum was just, you know, pulling you in lots of really intense directions, which, you know, in a lot of ways, that's what opera does. It's mm -hmm. intense. Um, and so I, I really enjoyed uh, seeing that through the all three films. Um, I, I was texting uh, in the private chat here while I was watching just this kind of crazy, excited play-by-play -play of, of just remembering in things that were really important to me. Um, I, I do remember that, that beautiful um, viola uh, uh, moment that um, you hear Renee play um, was one of the first things that I thought I've got to have those musicians close up. I wanted the musicians in the piece. Mm -hmm. um, and that lent itself um, also to having the, uh, the South Asian musicians in the piece also. I love that. I loved that. I just I thought that. it was I awesome. I loved it. And it's the close up on the tabla player the and tabla. his hands in the recording studio. And I think you know, I remember our early concept conversation, Misha, you really wanted to focus some of the time on the instrumentalists. And so huge shout out to our HGO orchestra artists for going along on the ride with us for that particular episode. And I do want to um, just acknowledge all of the locations that we used here in Houston yes. were very generous with their time, their space, their resources with us that made shooting this on location here in Houston possible, my house included. And um, I just want to acknowledge all of those spaces because uh, we appreciated them and their commitment to um, Houston film. So each one of these episodes, we kind of took a different approach on the back end of things. Each filmmaker brought their own sensibility to every episode, and I hope you see that. But I was commenting that the all three really hang well together, and it's not just that one little taste of Shakespeare throughout, but it's the, the, the love and care for opera and storytelling that's so clear in everybody's work. So thank you both so much for sharing mm -hmm. that with us. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank, Thank you. you. We hope there's more pieces in the future for, for everyone. <laughs> we, we do too. I want to thank all of our audience too out there in Absolutely. the internet world um, for tuning in and hanging with us tonight. You can share this live stream with your friends on your social media networks. Please do. We'd love for these uh, little operas, mini operas to get out there a bit more. You can also find them on the HGO YouTube channel and you can follow us like, share, subscribe, all those things. Hit the notification bell icon. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Great. And Colleen, also, any last words? Yes. And for information about these pieces and all of the amazing projects that HGO Co. does throughout the season, you can visit our website at hgoco.org. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.